wants to turn my face. We're reading from Romans 11, verses 25 to 36 from the New King James Version. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the Deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them. When I take away their sins, concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so these also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you they also may obtain mercy. For God has commanded them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on them. O oh, the death of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counsellor? Or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him? For of him and through him and to him all are all things to whom be glory for ever. Amen. I invite Wayne to come up and bring the message that's been laid upon his heart from the Lord. I've been getting some noise and etc about the police that was shot up in Queensland this week. So uh, when we went through Luke chapter 13, we have the answer, the biblical way of looking at all these types of things. So um, people are so shocked and so forth. But when we read Luke 13, you, you remember it. Jesus was confronted with the, the fact that Pilate had killed Jews and mingled their blood with sacrifices around the altar and people were shocked by this and uh, you know what this the unseeming unfairness and of this and then the pool at uh, the tower at Siloam fell over and killed 18 people and they were saying whose fault is this you know because the Jews had this system of you know somehow this is undeserving and yeah and gee what was Jesus answer and it's our answer to people who ask us because we've got a very confused world about everything really and the answer is um, uh, the same thing will happen to you except you repent except you repent the same thing will happen to you likewise and what, what we say to people uh, in reality is they generally ask us the wrong questions they said, why is this, you know, the seeming unfairness of God and the God's a God of love, why is this, why is, you know, these lovely, young, beautiful-faced police officers suddenly killed like that? Uh, why, why, why? Well, the, they're asking the wrong questions. The wrong questions is, the right question is, why, scripturally speaking, does anyone live? Of course, all have sinned. The wages of sin is death. And we're still alive. So, and the other answer is, everybody dies. Everybody dies. No one escapes it, ever. All right, so whether it's by a sudden disaster, uh, mass shootings, uh, by really evil, sinful people, um, everybody dies. The issue is, have you repented so that you can look into the face of Jesus he can, in, and he can say, who that liveth, liveth and believeth in me shall never, never die. die. Okay, that's the gospel. And that's the way we respond to those things, as tragic as they are. It doesn't mean you're not sympathetic at all. It's just uh, this world does need a cold, hard dose of reality sometimes. And it shocks them. They need to look in the mirror. We all die. Are you ready? The rich man, chapter 12. Uh, build up all these things, the covetous man. You fool, this night thy soul is required of thee. It was Jesus' response to him. 
you're going to be one of the, you're going to have a sudden disaster, you're going to amass a fortune, you fool. And then whose will all those things that you've amassed be? Now just go on to somebody that never earned them or anything like that. And the answer of Jesus is, fear not what man can do to the body, rather fear him who is able to destroy soul and body in hell. So that's the perspective. Now, uh, Romans chapter 11, uh, we're answering this question uh, where Jesus, he, he confronts the Jews, he knows they're going to crucify him and he looks at Jerusalem and he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that kill us the prophets, stone us those that are sent unto thee. Uh, how often would I have gathered you to me? But Jesus knows the whole history of Israel. He knows the whole history of redemption. Henceforth you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Messiah. And we're trying to get a, a, a scope of history, a biblical history, so we can... Um, know what that means and when will that be and how that works out and so we're looking in Romans chapter 11 where it's all explained for us I'm not interested in going into covenant theology or dispensational theology or any of those things I know what they all how they approach it all right um, I take a literal approach and I'll just explain the text the text will speak for itself okay uh, so when that's what I'll do now. I'll explain the text. I've already explained uh, the first 24 verses. That was lightning. And when I did that, we found out, and I've been going way back um, in the covenants, you know, and I said, in this text, Romans 11, there's two trees. There's a wall olive tree, and, and there's a, um, a cultivated olive tree, which represents Israel. And this one is cultivated right back into the prophets, Abraham, and the covenant with God made with Abraham, where he will bless Abraham and bless all the families of the world through Abraham by faith. By faith. So it's a covenant of faith. And that's, that's the foundation of the Bible. Um, Genesis chapter 12, 15 and 17. Through you shall all uh, nations of the earth be blessed. See the sand on the shore? so shall your seed be. See the stars above, can you count them? No, so shall your seed be. To who? Abraham. Jesus was a Jew. Abraham was a Jew. The apostles were Jews. All these covenants were given to the Jewish nation, not to Gentiles. Now, we Gentiles, we saw last time, and I gave myself as an example, and here is the illustration. We were cut out of a wild olive tree by nature over here and were grafted in contrary to nature into the good olive tree. Be not high-minded, but fear, he says. Um, and the Jews, who you, you read the last chapter of Acts, you know what Paul said to the Jews. He said, oh, well, spake Isaiah, the prophet unto you. You've, you've got ears, but you don't hear. You've got eyes, but you don't see. Henceforth, I will go to the Gentiles. And you, here you are, with your fingers in your ears, with all your orthodox exterior trappings of Judaism, which has got nothing to do with true faith in Christ, or God, you've, been, you've now been cut off <coughs> from the olive tree, and you're down here. You're cut off. But Paul is at pains to make this point. He is a Jew, and his heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. All right? I say the truth. He says... I say that, has God cast away his people forever? God forbid! For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Judah. Okay, God has not cast away his people. And now we come, I, I can't spend a lot of time on that rehash. Okay, I'll go straight to verse 24, uh, 25. For I would not have you, who's he writing to? Roman believers, 
most of whom uh, would be Gentiles, would be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise. What mystery? That they've been cut off and you've been grafted in to the covenant of faith. I'll write that. I did. The covenant of faith. You've been grafted into belief um, in God. Now, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery. Mystery in the New Testament means something that wasn't revealed in the Old Testament but is now made clear. He explains this at the end of Romans chapter 16. All right, it's not clear in the Old Testament, but it's now made clear. So he says, if he's saying it on the negative. If, if he says, I don't want you to be ignorant, it means he wants you to he wants you to know about this. I want you to know about something that was hidden in the Old Testament. The fact that Gentiles will be saved with Jews. And we would call that today the church. And here he goes. He says, Lest you be wise in your own conceits. Whoa! That's Paul having a little shot at pride. And conceit means um, you're full. In Australia, we'd say you're full of yourself. That's conceit. Don't you, as a Gentile, become so full of yourself that you think you know the plan of God for the ages? Is what he's saying. That blindness, in part, is happened to Israel. So what's this blindness that's happened to Israel? And what's this deafness that's happened to Israel? It is in part. It's partial. In other words, it's not permanent. It's part of the plan of God to enable us to be grafted in to salvation. And... Is happened unto Israel, and he tells us until what the fullness of the Gentiles come in. The word fullness means um, another word for salvation. Fullness of the Gentiles, when every last Gentile who is chosen by God from the foundation of the world to receive eternal life has received eternal life, then God will start grafting Israel. That will be the trigger for God to, to graft Israel back into the covenant of faith. For he, that's what he says. And so, all, what? Israel. Israel will be, in the future, what? Saved. Saved. All right, and the word all is means what? All. All. <laughs> all. Okay, now how does that happen? To, a little bit... He's contrasting a remnant with the all. In the beginning of this chapter, he said, uh, well spoke Isaiah the prophet, saying, um, and so forth. Uh, uh, Isaiah was complaining, Lord, I killed my prophets, dig down on all and I'm left alone, and they seek my life. What did, what's the answer of God to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. In other words, I have a remnant. Now here he says, yeah, there's, a, there's a remnant even now at this present time. Paul was part of the remnant. He was on the tree. Where is he? Over here. He was part of the remnant. Now he's saying, look, we've got a remnant here, but now we've got Gentiles grafted in. But one day all Israel will be saved. As it is written, out of Zion will come to deliver and will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Another word for Israel. For this is my what? Covenant. What covenant? The new covenant. This is my... This. That's why I split the tree, see? Um, to fit the covenant in. What else has happened along Israel's little journey? Oh, they've had the law. We, I spent a lot of time on that one day, didn't I? I went to Galatians. You remember that so well. <laughs> it's the trouble with all these gaps we have. Um, uh, there's also the Davidic covenant. All these covenants are with who? God. Israel. Israel. Davidic. And these are all very relevant. Even when we go through Luke, one of the lepers yelled out to Jesus, Thou son of David. Thou son of... They knew. 
They knew the covenants that a king would come from the line of David. They knew that would rule over them. They knew in the new covenant one day all Israel would be saved. Um, this is Jeremiah 31. If you want to look it up later. You should. I tried to learn it. Something like this. Along these lines. Um, Behold, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers when I took them out of the land of Egypt and took them by the hand out of the land of Egypt, which covenant they broke, which was that? The law. You do this, I'll bless you. You don't do it, I'll curse you. They broke. Behold, there's a new covenant. After those days, there will be a new covenant, Jesus. Uh, God said, uh, Jeremiah wrote and God said, there will be a new covenant when I will put my law in their minds and I will write it in their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. No one will say to his neighbour or his brother, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For this is my covenant, when I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. Whoa. And when Jesus stood up the night before he died and said, This is the new covenant in my blood, you and I partake of the initial spiritual aspects of that covenant. We're part of that new covenant, but it will not be fully fulfilled until all Israel is saved. When he turns away ungodliness from Jacob. When will that be? When the fullness of the Gentiles is come in. That's when it will be. When will that be? When the last person who will ever be saved is saved and that will trigger an event that Israel won't know what hit them they will not know what hit them then will be great tribulation such as and not since the beginning of the world neither nor ever shall be and unless those days should be shortened there would no flesh be saved but for the elect of Israel's sake those days will be shortened it is even the time of Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah 30. So the, 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 the fullness of the Gentiles will trigger in the, the time of trouble for Israel in the future. It hasn't happened yet. I know all the theologies. Um, hasn't happened yet. Read Revelation chapter 6 right through to 19 and you'll see a picture of it. God, the, 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 the seals are open, the last seal is open, the trumpets are blasted, the last trumpet is blasted, the bowls are poured out on the planet. And why isn't uh, the, why isn't the old Gentile church mentioned there? Because they're not there, they're raptured out. Okay, it's just for Israel. And they are brought under the rod of God's divine judgment and purged. And out of that comes a pure from the least to the greatest. And they will go into the kingdom of God. Lord, will you at this time extend, uh, restore the kingdom to Israel? No, not yet. <laughs> You've got to wait. And that's in the future. Uh, but Israel will go through that. Um, they've, they've had centuries of sin. They've had centuries of judgment. They're in judgment right now. And that judgment's going to really heat up in the future. Okay, let's keep going in Romans 11. Um, for this is my covenant, just to explain it, when I shall take away their sins. As, con as concerning the gospel, from the standpoint of the gospel, verse 28, they're enemies for your sakes. If you want to look from the standpoint of the gospel, well, they're enemies for your sakes, for your sakes, so you can get grafted into the gospel blessing. But as touching the what? The election they are beloved for the Father's sakes. God elected Israel when he made a promise to Israel that he would bless them and curse them, that curse them and bless them. He made a promise 
through this man here, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel is elect on that promise, chosen on that promise, and for the father, these people's sakes, God will hold them, him to it. It will happen. Now, keep going. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. What does that mean? That it, it means that if God says something, if God gives you a gift, anyone a gift, um, he won't take it back. <laughs> All right? So the gift of God is what? Eternal life. Yeah. Would you like God to take that back? You wouldn't, would you? And you wouldn't. God promised to Israel that one day he would save the entire nation. All right? And he won't repent of that. He will do it. The gifts and calling of God, they are a chosen elect nation. We've been grafted in to that blessing. Now, uh, now that you're going to see three verses for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Verse 30, 31, 32, uh, they've got one thing in common, the word mercy. The word mercy, for as you, who, Gentiles, in time past had not believed God, here we were over here, outside all the covenants, outside all the blessing, and now through the, what? Mercy of God. The mercy of God we've been taken from here. And if you want to know what here is like, um, Ephesians 2. Uh, Ephesians 2. I'll, I can't tend to go off my... I'm trying to memorise Ephesians. It's taken me two years. <laughs> When you get older, it gets harder. <laughs> exactly, but I'm going further down. But at that time, but at that time, you were without Christ. You were, you were aliens from the Commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers from the covenants of promise. You were and. These are some of the saddest words in the Bible. You had no hope. Like all those people you've been praying about around Christmas time now. They have no hope. What a way to live a life. No hope. You contrast that with this, First Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ that in his great mercy we men have been born again into a life full of hope. What a contrast. And yet when we're down here, without hope and without God in the world. But now, up here. And so we come back to uh, Romans 11. Um, For in time past you, you didn't believe God, yet now have obtained mercy through their unbelief. Even so, these also have now not believed, these ones here, that through the mercy, same mercy that was shown to you, don't you think that God can be merciful to them again and put them back in? Yes, he can. That's what he's saying. And this is one of those um, tricky little theological things too. We often get accused of where does evil come from and all this, uh, similar to what, uh, the, where did all that shooting and stuff come from and there's a little bit of an answer here even so for God has concluded them all verse 32 for God has concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy that word mercy this is what mercy means favourable disposition towards somebody with practical consequences so God was favourably disposed towards us and he gave his son to die for us, to give us eternal life and a life full of hope. That's mercy. Okay, so you want to celebrate something at Christmas time? Celebrate that. God has shown mercy to me. And anyway, don't you think he can show, he showed mercy to us, don't you think he can show it to Israel again? <coughs> yes, he can. 
Uh, for God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. And this is the way he did it. Um, Adam sinned. He passed his sin upon all the seed. Everyone that's born into this world is born in the same basket. They're all what? Sinners. We're all in unbelief. Everyone is. Now we're all... Now, and God has done in mercy... What only God can do provided a way to get away from the consequences of sin, which is eternal damnation, in his son Jesus Christ's death on the cross. Now that way is available to who? All. That's what he's saying. He can show mercy. In all around in unbelief, mercy has been shown to all. Now that if that mercy is not taken up. Whose fault's that? It's the person's. <coughs> and you know, you you know as well as I do that ninety nine point nine percent of God was walking around refusing the mercy of God. Today, we know that. It's always a remnant, and that's heartbreaking. It really is. Um, Romans three. <coughs> He's right. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, <coughs> there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. So a lot of people running around trying to be justified by some sort of law standard. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. But now, the righteousness of God... Apart from the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. They look at Jesus Christ and say, yes, he fulfilled every requirement. The prophets all say, he is the Messiah, the son of David. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, in Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. Just have to believe. Faith. For there is no difference. For all have sinned. Jew and Gentile have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Wow. Back to Romans 11. That's mercy. For God hath concluded, verse 32, for God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Okay, at this point, Paul just takes a deep breath and is what we would say gobsmacked by the theology. And I'm gobsmacked by the theology. Um, I've, I've told you, I think Romans is the greatest piece of literature the world's ever seen. There's just layer upon layer upon layer of logical truth. And each bit just supplements the next bit and adds to it slightly. And Paul has been inspired by the Holy Spirit writing this down. And at this point, he's, he's just seen the whole plan of redemption. Where God brings, chooses a nation, makes a covenant with them. He knows there's all these other people in the world. So he sets aside, he's always got a remnant in that nation. He sets aside uh, their unbelief. And then he brings the others in to the blessing. And then he, then he looks, at, looks at it and he says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. I couldn't have thought of a plan like that. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. These, 
And then he gives three rhetorical questions. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counsellor? Who has first given to him? And it hasn't been recompensed back to him. They're rhetorical questions, obvious answers. Who has known the mind of the Lord? You and I haven't. <laughs> Let me qualify that slightly. This is the mind of the Lord. All right? But none of us can plummet to its fullest depths until glory. That'll be great, won't it? That'll be great. But we do have the mind of the Lord, but we can't plumb the utter depths of it. Who has been his counsellor? You know, well, we'll work out the plan of the ages and we'll say, we'll, we'll, we'll say who goes into which slot and when and so forth. Who has been his counsellor? Does God ever have to sit around in a boardroom with him? <laughs> no one can give him any advice. He knows, he knows it all. Or who has first given to him and it has to be recompensed back to him again? Who's going to give to God anything that he hasn't already got? And Paul knows this and he's just, he knows the obvious answers. And then he says, for of him, through him, to him, he's the genesis of everything. It all works through him and it all works ultimately for him in the future. Past, present, future. And Paul can only say, to him be glory forever. To him be glory forever. Now, five minutes on the word glory. Doctor. Alright, what's it mean? The glory of God. It's very important we understand this because um, Christmas, glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth, goodwill to all men. Oh, please don't think that means you run around being friendly with each other. It doesn't. All right. When when he says glory to God, the heavenly hosts sing glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth. Peace on earth. Well, only what it means is when that baby is born, he will grow up and be crucified, and provide a way of salvation. Where in Romans five it says, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace. Peace with God. That's what it means. Because of this baby being born, men on earth can now have peace with God. Through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it means. And God sovereignly will impart his good will on men. It's God will be doing that. It's not us running around suddenly feeling good about um, um, <coughs> each other. We're sinners, right? Okay. So glory. There's two, two aspects to glory. And number one is... Glory is God's nature in and of itself. I think I understand this because I teach art and I have to explain art. And I often say to people, when, when you look at a photograph, you look at a series of facts. It just, it just, a camera just goes click, like our eyes, click and records a whole lot of facts about a scene. And when you, when, what an artist does, he strips all those facts away and gets to the essence of what's there, the truth behind the facts. And so when we think of the glory of God, we think of who God is in his essence, who he really is apart from everything else. That which is true of God which cannot be given to him and that which is true of God which cannot be taken away from him. So you can think of these things. Omnipotent. Omniscient. Immutable. Wise. All wise. Un uh, God who cannot lie. God who cannot change, immutable. All these attributes of God, if you could compress them somehow into one symbol, you would be looking into the face of Jesus Christ. If you could compress them into a symbolic presence if you like you would be looking into the Shekinah glory of the Old Testament a light and as I've told you before 
The symbol of his presence is not the prison of his essence. Alright, God, God can be 100% Jesus Christ walking around as we see in Luke there on planet earth and he can still be 100% God running the entire universe everywhere all powerful at the same time knowing everything. Alright, think of a pool of water a bowl of water if I go in that with a thimble and go in there I take it out, what's in there? Is that 100% that type of water? Yes, it is. But it's not the totality of all that water there. Okay, so uh, here's a corny, corny, uh, another way of explaining it, but it's important. I was tidying up this morning because Lindy's not there, and I got an old calendar. And this is how I, I teach art sometimes. See, that's a lovely painting, isn't it, by one of the Impressionists? Don't look too hard. It's just a lovely painting. And as I often say to people when they're painting trees, you're not going to paint every leaf, are you? You can't. You literally can't paint. There's, there's thousands of leaves on a tree. You can't paint every leaf. But that's a beautiful essence of that scene. True? That's gorgeous. That's the essence. That's what art is. And when we look at God, we just his essential nature. And somehow it's even better than a photograph, isn't it? Because <laughs> we can see it for what it is. Glory to God. Um, and, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, full of grace and truth. The attributes of God, immutable, omnipotent, merciful, gracious, Loving kindness. All this is God. And, and Paul is saying, to him be glory forever. The other aspect of glory is the fact that we give God glory. So God is glory. All his attributes combined. Unique, his essence. And we give glory to God. In other words, we give honour to God. For his glory. Now, how do we do that? We sang so many of those hymns, touched on that. If you want to go back over those when you go home, every one of those hymns we were singing were touching on that, giving glory and honour to God. We honour God. The best way to honour God is with your life. It's Christmas time. Oh, Paul said, Paul to me said it. There's two, I'll give you two answers here. One will just be the next verse. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you what? Present. You present your body a living sacrifice. Holy, why? Why holy? Because that's who God is. That's his essence. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and particularly in this day and age, do not be Conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you do that? Well, Paul gave us the answer, and I'll finish with this. Remember, God has his own intrinsic glory, and we give glory to his glory. That means we honour him. Look, we're in a terrible state now as a country. I was in Linda's hospital the other day, I have no offence against Aboriginals or anything like that, but I understand what that Satan is behind the world systems. You do too, right? Principalities and powers running the whole show. And uh, on the wall, um, we give honour and respect to the whatever country and nation it is. And then there's pictures on the walls of the Aboriginal folk and so forth. And I'm thinking, how are they ever going to crawl back from this to some form of sanity? You know, um, and then I thought, well, they won't. But one thing I know, my job is to give glory to God. God. And if these people, these people that are running our country, only, only would to sit, submit themselves to the glory of God, you would not have one whit of racism anywhere in the world. And it'll all be solved just like that. There's neither bond nor free, male nor female, black nor white. 
Who cares? We're all one in Christ. That gives glory to God. And so Paul, in, and I'll part with this, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, he says, he talks a lot about the law there, and one day I'll do that chapter. It's a marvellous chapter that not many people know much about. Um, throughout it, he says, We all, we all, you and I, now we're here, now we're here, now we're here, now we're waiting for here. We understand all of this. We're waiting for the redemption of Israel, the fullness of the Gentiles. Here we are, Christmas time, 2023. We all, with an unveiled face. In other words, when, when, when Moses here got the law, he went up to the mountain. He had to stick a veil over his face because he was confronted by the glory of God, the literal Shekinah glory. Just like um, Peter, James and John on the Mount of Transfiguration, the Lord Jesus just stripped away his flesh, so to speak, to show them what? The glory of the Lord. He was transfigured. And it's blinding. It said Peter, silly. <laughs> I'll build a tabernacle. Um, but we all, we all, now, here, now, that have this, and we know, with unveiled face, as in a mirror, we look at the glory of the Lord there in that book. We look at the glory of the Lord and are changed into that image. The image of Jesus Christ. The more you know about God by looking into that book, the more you will be changed into the image of Jesus Christ and the more from glory to glory. You'll, you'll go from one stage of glory or giving honour to God to another stage of glory, giving honour to God. You'll just mature. That's what sanctification is. You'll just go from glory to glory as you gauge into the image of the glory of Jesus Christ in this book. And that's why my parting gesture to me and to you is make sure you get your... I'll tell you one way not to be conformed to the world. Get your head in the book in 2023. And God bless you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for the word of God, Father. It's, um, it's such stability in an unstable world, Father. And we know the future, Lord. We're so privileged. And for all our loved ones, Father, we do pray again this time of year. It's so true. Um, it's, it's just so shallow. When I'm a visual person and I just see it around me, um, Lord, and it breaks your heart, breaks our heart, Father. Uh, but the best thing we can do to people is just show them how contented we are that we know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.